He already made it right. Amen. You have to catch up to it being right. Amen. I told somebody today, uh, I was in conversation, and they said, you know, people want to know, well, you know, is it a punishment when things go wrong? And, and you know, it's a natural question. But I told him, I said, here's the problem. That people think the bad thing was prompted by God when the bad thing is already happening. On, and God is the umbrella. On, Let me repeat that again. It's not that God is punishing you. It's that there is a punishment that he's protecting you from. All right, let's make it simpler. It's raining outside right now. And if you decide to go out, if it starts raining really hard, and you decide to go outside without an umbrella, what happens to you? Is that a punishment? No. Did God punish you? No. You catch a cold, you're wet, your clothes are drenched, you blame God, why did you wet me? <laughs> and he said, but I provided you an umbrella. No. The umbrella you can use. Yeah. The moment you walk outside, open your umbrella. To show that you are covered by me. The umbrella is blood red. You are covered and shielded. Stop blaming the bad thing on God. The bad thing is going to happen. But you have protection from that thing. It's not punishment. <laughs> it's crazy. It's not punishment. It's disobedience. It's not, did you catch that? It's not punishment. Oh, God's going to strike you down. I hate when I hear people telling other people, you know, God doesn't like that. How do you know? He smokes him right now. You got dealing with him? You're saying that God is mad at something you're mad at. You already said you before. You know, you can't keep telling people that God is mad at, you're mad at that. So now you want to throw a curse on that person, but you're the one who's mad at it. Say that God is the one who's upset. You know what the truth of that is? Hmm. And I don't know if this is a good thing to throw at you now, because we're going to be chewing on a lot of stuff. And there's something about having a full mouth. You start spitting stuff out. <laughs> so maybe I shouldn't tell you this right now. Come on, Reggie. Come on. Y'all can do this? Yeah. Here's, a, here's a funny thing. <laughs> that if God doesn't require, doesn't have time. We know that he's timeless. We serve a timeless God. My question to you is, when you get upset, did it require time to get there? Wow. Ooh. See, that's the problem. Now you're chewing. I see you. Now you're chewing. You're chewing on it. You're going, and I'm going to put some more things for you to eat. Because if time is a part of that, then that means that even the worst thing that was taking place in the Garden of Eden was not based on God being upset at man. Even Genesis chapter 6, where it says God clearly was tired of man, that means something else is going on there. Because for you to get me upset, it requires time. You got to do something within time for me to get upset. And then for me to drop down and being upset means easing up, it also requires time. Alright. Let's go. This is good stuff today. Trinity of God. The first model I'm going to give you, or one of the first uh, types of theology, thought process, is modelism. Modeling. Those of you who are writing stuff down, write this down. Modelism. M-O-D-A-L-I-S-M. And what it says here is that God is trinity by three modes of existence. Father at one time, Son at one time, and Holy Spirit at another time. That would mean that he's then now taken on morphing into three different portions in different times. Here's, here's what we got to look at. If that's the case, then that means that we are then worshiping three gods. If that's what we believe. For God being, and I'm going to take my time. If you see, I'm going, to talk, I'm going to talk slower than I usually do. Because I want you to leave here understanding this character of God. And then Isaiah 9 will make sense to you. If it was the case that before Jesus, only the Father moved. 
And if during the time of Jesus, only Jesus moved, and after Jesus, after he died on the cross and resurrected, only Holy Spirit moved, then you're missing out on who God is. Because his function never stopped being triune. When the Father spoke, the Son was the Word. Mm. Exodus chapter 3 has chosen an encounter with Moses at the burning bush. Amen. When he's, everybody saw the Prince of Egypt, right? I mean, because yeah, I just want to make sure everybody knows the story. Those who don't know the word, it's okay. I want you to know the story. And the bush was burning, but it wasn't consuming. It was not consuming fire. Moses shows up and the, he sees a bush, a bush that's burning, and it's not consuming what is burning. Then a voice comes out. Now, who's the voice? Jesus is the voice. That's why John said, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And to understand that, then now you're saying that Jesus was in the beginning as well. Yes, he was. In creation, Genesis chapter 1, Verse 1, what does it say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So what did he do to create? Ah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What was the earth? The earth was a what? A formless mass. It was empty. It was dark. It was, it was a prison. Then it said, the Spirit of God hovered upon the water, introducing the Holy Spirit. It was like a movie. <laughs> and then, at the end of that, verse 3, it says what? So, in the beginning was the Word, right? In the beginning, God created. Sounds familiar. In the beginning. John 1, Genesis 1 have a similarity. In the beginning, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created. In, be, in the beginning was the word. What word? The word spoken. What spoken word? The word that God spoke out of his mouth. And he said, let there be Jesus. But then you're going to say, but that means that there was a beginning then. No. To say let there be doesn't mean that there's a beginning. I can tell you, let there be you in that little section over there by the piano. What, what is let there be? What does it mean? Meaning access, assignment, let there be you there. That doesn't mean that Jesus was created. But it means that he was a part of creation. Please pay attention to that. We're going we're gonna to go somewhere. Let there be light. And what does John say about the light? John said that the light brought life to all. So that means Jesus being the light, he was able to overcome that which was dark. His role from the beginning was to be a part of creation. Hmm. So what about Holy Spirit? He's the one who hovered upon the waters. Because without the Spirit, there's no breath. You need the Father, you need the Son, and you need the Holy Spirit in function. And really, all that's been broken down for us, not for Him. Because the only way we can truly understand a relationship is by saying Father and Son. It's really for us. It's more complex than that. It's more profound than that. But we need to know, okay, Father, Son, simple. Let's take a look at this. The second one I want you to look at is Arian, Arianism, brought by Arius. Arius showed that the subordination of Jesus to God, the subordination mean, meaning God, then Jesus, was 
denying the deity or Godhead of Jesus the Christ. So this particular theological view states that God, then Jesus, and then maybe Holy Spirit, right? I say maybe Holy Spirit because a lot of people don't even believe that Holy Spirit is a person. Even to this day, you go to a church that says that they believe the Holy Spirit is a person, and they'll go, the Holy Ghost, you feel it? It's here. The minute you say it, mm -hmm. you've removed them as a person. Amen. So, to understand this particular concept is to say there's a level of subordination. Now, what do we believe? Do we believe that Jesus is subordinate to the Father? Okay, somebody said yes. Is the Father subordinate to Jesus? You say no. Whoa! Listen to what he just said. So Jesus is subordinate to the Father, and the Father is subordinate to Jesus? And we're going to prove that in the Word. We're not going to just say this. We're going to prove that this is the truth. You're going to leave here understanding God more, making your prayers more effective. Come on, Dad. That's good, man. Where you don't get caught up in the legalistic view that causes you to limit the power of God in your life. Hmm. Look at this. To deny the deity of Jesus because Christ was begotten, he had a beginning. Did Christ have a beginning? No. No. Did Jesus of Nazareth have a beginning? Yes. Yes. yes! Jesus of Nazareth was born like everyone else was born. Jesus of Nazareth also died Amen. like everyone else died. That's good. When the Father separated from Jesus on the cross, Jesus became of Nazareth. Come on now. The Nazarene or the Nazarite died. Meanwhile, who came back to life was the Christ. Because right, only the Christ can overcome death. Jesus. Only the Christ is able to succeed and be also the predecessor at the same time. My God. Ooh. My God. Successor and predecessor simultaneously. Alright, you're going to look at me like I'm crazy. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 9. <laughs> Some of y'all, y'all stay doing that to me. <laughs> Isaiah 9. And when you get there, just, just give me an amen. amen. Those of you at home, I hope you're really enjoying this. As I really want to make sure that people understand that we don't, we're not just making up stuff. Amen. This is biblical. Thank you, Lord. Isaiah received the revelation of the Trinity. Yes, Isaiah received the revelation of the Trinity. And in this revelation, he made it clear the function. And again, we can, just for the sake of those who don't like the word Trinity, I won't say Trinity. I'll just say God. You just got to figure out what I mean. Or maybe I'll say, wonderful counselor. And maybe I'll say, everlasting father. Or maybe I'll say Prince of Peace. Whichever you prefer. Ah, I know which one you like. I'll tell you mighty God. Because that would you probably enjoy. Let's read. Isaiah chapter 9. Let's start with verse 6. Look at this revelation. This is before the New Testament. Way before they wrote the gospel. This is Isaiah writing something that he had no idea about himself. Listen, look what he said. In a religion that is focused on God being one, because he even writes it in Isaiah 43.10. There is no other God. It's at least one. But look what he says about this person. He says, for a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Holy Spirit, Mighty God, 
Everlasting Father. All right, I'm going to go back. I'm going to read what's here. All right, I'm going to read what's here. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. What does it say? I'll tell you what it says. It says that the person who's coming, who already came, he's a what? Wonderful counselor? He's a what? Mighty God? Oh, I thought there was only one God. Right. So Isaiah now is calling this one to be born to us. He's calling him mighty God. Right. Already, that should be something that should raise up eyebrows. Mm -hmm. When you are monotheistic, mm -hmm. believing in one God, you should already go, well, wait a second. You're saying this person who's going to be born to us. Born to us meaning born, meaning flesh. For a child is born to us, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, those are four statements. Now, you're going to say, well, it, uh, so now you're saying they're four? No. <laughs> what I'm saying is, Wonderful Counselor is Holy Spirit. Mighty God is all three of them. Everlasting Father is the Father. And Prince of Peace is the Son. Amen. Let me repeat that again. What I'm telling you is, ever, Wonderful Counselor is Holy Spirit. Well, let's prove that first. Is the Wonderful Counselor Holy Spirit? Amen. Let's find out. Yes. Let's go to John 14. Let's go to John 14. We got, we're going to do this right today. I want nobody confused and, oh, I didn't understand. Is that really in the word? Yes, it is. John 14, and we're going to read this. Uh, we'll go to verse 15. Ready? If you love me, here's, here's, the, here's the commandment. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I ask the Father, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate slash counselor. He will give you another counselor. Meaning that Jesus is one and he is notice it doesn't say it. Watch this. Watch this. Who will never leave you. I'm going to give you a counselor. So I'm going to play my part. Do what I have to do. Give you a counselor. That counselor is still me. Because according to Isaiah 9, the child that's born to us is wonderful counselor. So Jesus is the wonderful counselor. He is Holy Spirit. He says, I'm leaving, but I'm not really leaving. When I go, I'll be here. But because you don't understand that I'm going to tell you I'm leaving, and I'm going to tell you that one, the, the counselor, Holy Spirit, will be here. He'll be with you the whole time. Because if I don't say it this way, you're going to think I left. But I'm here by way of me. Me, I'm leaving. Me, stay here with them. Look what it says. It says here, who will never leave you. He is, he, everybody say he. he. Thank you. Can you say it one more time? He. he is the Holy Spirit who leads into some truth. Oh, good. You're listening. <laughs> Who leads to all truth. That means that the reason why religions are spawning up all over the place and have spawned up in the past is because they try to build up. They try to build this up without the one who gives the truth. <laughs> you cannot build up without the one who gives you the truth. You can't say, I know Jesus who is the truth. Without the one who leads you to the truth. So what happens? So many people forget about Holy Spirit. Consider him a thing. And don't realize that the relationship is with him. Including him. Made by him. 
That's why I said, I don't have to say Trinity. I don't have to say Trinity. I could tell you him, he. And to me, the function is stronger. I know who he is to me, and I know him because of him. Amen. Look, 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 look. I know him because of him who gives me life, who's also him. No, no, it's bad. Watch this. Watch this. <laughs> I know him because he led me to him who gave me life by him. Amen. It is three. I know him who taught me or gave me information about him, whose information led me to live by him. That sounds to me like Jesus when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am Holy Spirit, I am myself, the truth, and I am the life, my Father. Who's getting this? So if you are getting this, then that means something inside of you is starting to transform. Because the more you know the identity of your creator, the more your body responds, even physically, to the truth. Because what happens? There are lying agents in your body. Lying, not lying. Yes. Lying. Yes. They're lying. Yes. Cancer is a liar. Yes. It lies and convinces other cells to join it. Right. Wow. Telling other cells you know, you're worth nothing. Or exaggerating a situation causing the cells to do something they're not supposed to do. Who's getting this? Yeah. The authorization of a cell because something false was told to a cell. And if you don't know the truth, then you can't get life. And you can't get to the truth without the way, Amen. which is Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, let's go into that Holy Spirit part, right? I want to share with you something else. And it's interesting because Jesus always spoke about, he always spoke in different ways. And one of the ways he spoke, and we find it in Matthew chapter 12, go there, Matthew 12, verse 31. There, there are things he says, but it was dispensational. So those of you who have learned under this te these teachings, who have been under these teachings for a while, you'll know what I mean by dispensational truth. Here's a dispensational truth. Matthew 12. Go to verse 31. We'll start with 30. I just like 30. Just kind of makes sense. Look what it says, 12:30. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. Let me read that again. Real slow. Look. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me. If you're not with Jesus, you're opposing him. That's an obvious one. But look at the second one he says. And anyone who isn't working with me so anyone who's idle, who's not doing anything, who's not working with him in the kingdom, is actually working against him. Wow. So even if you're not doing it, I'm not doing anything, I'm just living. Wow. Your living is working against him. Because you have not done anything for him. What is the heart of God? Right. Verse 31. So I tell you, every sin... And blasphemy, I tell you every sin, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will never be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven. Anybody who speaks against Jesus, anyone who speaks against me, he's saying, anyone who speaks against me can be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Either in this world or in the world to come. What a dilemma. What a predicament. What a debacle. What a conundrum. Look. Here's the problem. The problem here is that people don't realize that everything Jesus said within a space of time, that time period, had a truth because Jesus could not lie. 
Everybody with me so far? Amen. So because Jesus can't lie, his truth would come out and sound offensive because of the dispensation he was in. Listen carefully. The reason why Jesus said things that were offending, like, you know, if, if, you listen, if your eyes are causing you to sin, causing you to sin gouge it out. And then people will literally, they literally go with that. You know, if your hand's calling you to sin, chop it off. It's better to have one hand in heaven than two hands in hell. You know, I mean, these are dispensational truths, right? When Jesus said it, he was still in the Old Testament. Uh, but isn't it in Matthew and Mark and Luke? Isn't that New Testament? Because I, I can hear it. It is a New Testament book, but the accounts in the New Testament book are still Old Testament until Jesus dies on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, that was the New Covenant. The New Covenant was after he shed blood. The New Covenant was after he, he did the sacrifice, and the proof of the New Covenant was the resurrection. Watch, listen. Whoever before rose themselves up from the dead, who? Never. Never. So this statement is a true statement that he was making before he died on the cross. He's saying we got a dilemma because all of you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. What I'm telling everybody who's listening to me right now is that all of you are not going to make it. Ah, <laughs> uh, you didn't get that. Well, good. Jesus made a statement here. His statement was, Listen, he says, anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven. In other words, you guys talking against me is cool. But what they didn't realize is that speaking against him is also speaking against. Because they are. <sighs> because their oneness, Jesus made a statement. It was a true statement. He said, if to me in my Nazarite body, you get forgiven as man, <laughs> but as the deity, you will never be forgiven, not here or heaven. You got a problem. You better hope I go to the cross and die on the cross for you. Because based on the statement, you don't qualify to go to heaven. Did you hear? Jesus, what? it wasn't a mistake. He spoke this on purpose. He wanted them to know you're already blaspheming. You're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. How many people here have blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Show of hands. Come on now. If you didn't raise your hand. So let me explain what blaspheming the Holy Spirit is, right? Because maybe you're not know, maybe maybe you're thinking, oh, I, I've never done that before. I'll, I'll do something real simple. Somebody moving in the spirit. And you start talking about that not being true. You, oh no, how about this one? Somebody moving the spirit and start laughing. Or, or start making the noise that they make. The move of the spirit is an action of the Holy Spirit. And you de decline or deny it by making fun of it. You better believe you need Jesus. Amen. Because if you don't receive the promise of Jesus the Christ, you remain guilty of that crime. And if you remain guilty of that crime, then this will apply to you. This is what he says. He's not, he's not playing. He's telling them, don't mess with the Holy Spirit. Look what he says. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. And I'll take it even further. Not in this life or the life after. Not in this world or the other world. Not anywhere. He was adamant about that. Because he wanted people to understand that this is not a game. We got a hand up. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Got a microphone? Amen. Thank you, Lord. So, in reality, by default, religious folks who use in the book of Acts about Ananias blaspheming the Holy Spirit 
In all reality, they really don't have the understanding of the Trinity because if they did, they would understand that Holy Spirit is the Son of Man, who is the Father, who is Mighty God, who is the Wonderful God, hey! who is everything. Yes, He is Mighty God. He is Prince of Peace. He is Wonderful Counselor. He is Everlasting Father. By saying, by saying you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit and, you know, that can never be forgiven, then, then you're saying that that's another God. You're not saying that it's still one because it doesn't matter what I call him, whether I call him the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, whatever, it's still him. I'm blown away. I'm glad that you are. <laughs> and we're going to talk about the Ananias and Sapphira, being that you brought it up. Let's talk about that. All right, because I know there are churches that use this to scare people. Let's remove the fear because fear is not of God. Oh, I'm going to say that again. If fear is the reason why you're going to church, those of you at home, I wish this was in Spanish too. If fear, si miedo, es la razón. That's good, I like that. Que tú estás yendo a la iglesia. Pues el miedo y el temor no es de Dios. Because perfect love, amor perfecto, cast out all fear. Amen. Where God is, fear is not. So if there's fear, then you've eliminated God. All right, so let's talk about this fear tactic that somebody used by the name of Peter. Did I say that? Acts chapter 5. Go with me there. Acts chapter 5, verse 1. The, the story that scared me to death. The story that made me think, you know what, man, God is out to take you out for blood. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, Acts chapter 5 is after Jesus died on the cross. This is called the Acts of the Apostles. This is after the resurrection. So the new covenant is now in order. The new covenant is in order. Amen? Amen. Look at this. But there was a certain man named Ananias who his wife, with his wife Sapphira, they sold some property. Please listen to the story. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. In other words, I promise to give you all of this. When all of this came, uh, I'll take part of it, let me give the rest. And then told his wife, listen, don't say a word. We're going to give this amount. I know, I know, honey, I know. We got this whole amount, but we need this amount for, for the rent. So, you know, so, you know, let's give them this amount. Don't get mad at me. I feel you. He broke part of it. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan? Who said it? Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit. Who did he lie to? Who did he lie to? He lied to Peter. You can't lie to somebody. Listen, listen. I told you in heaven there's no lies, right? Because in heaven, he knows it all. Like the devil, the devil, the devil is not a liar in heaven. He's a liar on earth. He's not, he's not a deceiver in heaven. You can't deceive the one who knows it all. And you know, I really wasn't there. No. That's why when he was asked the question in the book of Job, where are you, bro? What you doing? The devil couldn't be like, well, you know, I was, no, I'm walking around seeing and patrolling the earth. And then God said, have you considered my servant Job? The property was yours to sell. No, let me go back. You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not to sell. As you wish. In other words, don't say you're going to do something. It was yours in the first place. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. So he put his case up in heaven. Peter took his case and presented it and said, you lied 
to God. Was Peter right? Well, he, he, what he, Peter was right about. Peter was right that he lied. Peter had a case against him. The problem is that Jesus died on the cross. And then I ask this question to all of you. Listen to carefully. What Jesus had done was about to take place. I'm about to read it. And I want you, while I'm reading it, I want you to ask yourself, would Jesus have done this? Here we go. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, la la la, here comes his wife oblivious to what happened to her husband. Not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Okay, so now, now the story changes a little bit. Now it's not, I'm going to take you out because you lied to God. Now I know the answer. Peter knew the answer. That is entrapment. You already know what's going to be the case. You're setting that person up. Where is the discipline in that? Or should we call this punishment? You're not trying to correct her. Or oh, you say, well, what about the church? They're trying to correct the church. Mm. Peter had a problem. We know this because Peter cuts ears. We know that Peter ain't thinking about nothing. He's going to cut the instrument you hear from. Right. Just remove it. Why? Because he's impulsive. Reactive. Right. He's not proactive. He's reactive. Emotional. Extremely. Yeah. And it's about taking care of it right now. None of us in this room is like that. That's why we can't understand it. <laughs> What do you mean reactive? We think about everything before every argument. I think about what I say. I'm sorry, we got the church, man. This is the church right here. I don't say nothing that hurts anybody. I think about it. Yes, she replied. Set up. That was the price. Yes, it was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside. They're right outside that door. And they will carry you out too. <clears throat> Instantly she fell to the floor and died. How do we celebrate this? How are there Christians outside that celebrate this? When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Like, oh, okay. okay took her and buried her. So then I ask you the question. Who pulled the trigger? Peter. Peter. Peter pulled the trigger. Peter's anointing was such that he could do it. Because he was anointed. And his anger allowed his anointing to get into that place he had a justified reason to present that person's case in heaven and that person received the consequence. He dies. He dies because at that moment or they die, at that moment the power cannot be negated from Peter. A gift is given. That's why God, he is particular to who he gives the gifts to. Because unfortunately, you give certain people a knife. You give certain people a knife. You're right. Instead of cutting bread, they'll stab you with it. Instead of using butter to spread butter, they'll... they'll, they'll mm. And the thing about it is that Everyone will be given a knife. Hear what I'm saying? Why? 
All right, how about this one? Let's make it even better. Everyone will be given a sword. Everyone will be given a sword. And the sword is up to you what you use it for. Amen. The truth is, this situation is what we find a lot happening. People moving in power and authority, having an anointing. That's why, you know, I, I give glory to God that, you know, with as many people have that I've, that, you know, I have knives in my back. And yes, knives that, just like Jesus, that he gives knives, I gave knives. Please hear what I'm saying. Jesus will give you the sword, but you can use that sword and put it right in his back. He'll never take your sword away from you. There are people without Holy Spirit that starting their own things out there because they have no guidance of the truth. The truth is not there because they have no guidance to the truth. And because they don't have the truth, they can't offer life. And life in abundance. That's good. Hmm. Let's continue. John 5. We're going to finish with this. Let's go to John 5. I want to show you something about the triune God. The triune God. John 5, 21. When you get there, please. Let's start with verse 19. Now, this is a play in words. Last week I showed you in John chapter 3 how Jesus was speaking plural. Anybody remember that? Amen. He was speaking in plural. Now, this, is, this, this becomes one of those. He's saying something, but what he's saying speaks of his nature, his deity. Look what it says. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. So what is Jesus saying? I can do nothing by myself. I do everything I see the father do. Whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man then you will truly be astonished. For just as the Father gives life to those he raises from the dead, so the Son gives life to anyone he wants. In addition, the Father judges no one. In addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son absolute authority to judge. So what? Okay, let, let's, let's, let's get these points in. Does the Father judge? According to the statement, we're going to go according to the statement. Does the Father judge? No. Who has absolute authority to judge? Jesus. He just said that. Pay attention. So that everyone will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. What is absolute authority? Anybody? Absolute authority. What does it mean? All authority. So absolute means... Complete, entire. So if God gives Jesus absolute authority, what is God saying? He's saying, you are God. Let's keep 100. I'm giving you absolute authority to do what I do. Absolute means complete authority. So that everyone will honor the Son just as, the, just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. So who has eternal life? Come on, guys. Stay with me. This is good stuff. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. So then, if we are doing a math problem, A equals B, and A equals C. Therefore, B 
must equal. I know you don't want to think right now. <laughs> Maybe I might put it up somewhere you see it. You three come up here for a minute. Face them. So that you guys can understand what I'm talking about. It's not really a math problem. So try to eliminate that because I know in the archives of your <laughs> processing, a lot of you hated math so much that the minute I said math, you blanked out. <laughs> Okay, A, B, and C, right? A equals B. She is equal to her, right? But she's also equal to her. Did you catch that? Yeah. All right, so if she's equal to her, and she's also equal to her, then what are we saying? That B and C are also equal. That level of equality is us understanding. The math here is clear. What is he saying? Let's read. What is he saying? You can, you can read if you want to read. That way I can do this over here at the same time. What is, what is he saying? I tell you the truth. What is he saying? Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. Okay. Those who listen to my message and believe in God are what? Have eternal life. What is the requirement for eternal life? Believe. believe. No, no, no. I just believe. Stop listen. it. Listen. You got to listen. Listen and believe. Meaning that both are important. Listen and believe. So now there's a little twist with John 3.16. Because John 3.16 says what? You must, who, those who what? Believe. Now Jesus is saying again, those who listen and believe. Y'all can be serious. I'm going to take your spot here. If I was to right now tell you that all three are the same and equal, then that means what Jesus is about to say right now, what I'm about to read to you regarding Jesus, should not confuse you and shouldn't make you think that there is a contradiction in the word. Let's read. Let's do this. It says here, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins. But they have already passed. They have what? They have already passed from death into life. That right now, if you listen and believe, you have passed from death to life. And everything that life has to offer, you don't have to wait till you die to get it. And I, I assure that I assure you that the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when the dead will hear my voice and the voice of the Son of God. And those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself. And he has granted that same life-giving power to his Son. And he has given him authority to judge. He says it again. He has given him. Who has authority to judge? Son. Who has absolute power? Son. Jesus. Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son. <laughs> and they will rise again. So whose voice are they looking to hear? God's Son. Which is still God. Amen. And they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life. And those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. Those who will rise... So did you catch that? So everybody's going to rise. Everybody's going to rise. Good, bad, and ugly. Where you go next will be determined by the listen party. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I can do nothing on my own. Whoa, whoa, wait. Didn't you say you have absolute power? 
And now you're saying I can do nothing on my own? He then says, I judge as God tells me, but didn't you say I have absolute power and I'm the one who judge? God judges no one. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. He went from son to father to father to son. His words were clear. He stated that he, as the son, had all power to judge. He said that he, as the son, had absolute power. Am, am, are we reading the same thing? Yeah. Can I get an amen? amen? Just to let me know that you are really capturing this. Not because I want, I don't ask for amens for, for me to feel good. I just want to know that you're listening and getting it. If you're not, then I should see hands. Because this is a Bible study. I want you to capture this truth about who God is and that when Jesus spoke, he didn't speak the way he did just because, oh, it was, it was I'm just going to speak this way because it sounds good. He was doing it on purpose. He wanted people to understand his unity. He wanted people to understand what Isaiah 9 says. He is the one who was born to us. He is the one who is the wonderful counselor. He is the one who is our father. Yes, Jesus is our father. Amen. Linear thinking doesn't permit that. Because linear thinking says God is subject to everything we are subject to here in time. Linear thinking tries to justify the unjustifiable. Linear thinking tries to get you to a place to think that if this, then this, but this is not what you think. So you don't know what this is. For example, do we have a history of who you are and where you came from? And do you, is there a chronological order? And do you have a beginning? Okay, thank you. <laughs> is, your, is your sister here? Could she testify to some of your beginnings? Yeah. Does she know some of your stories? Yeah. Okay. Is your wife here? Yeah. Does she know stories that your sister doesn't know? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Good answer. <laughs> you know, those moments are yours, and you have a, a, a chronological order of events that pertain to you. So what's relative to you is, that everything, this is the natural order of things. This is the first time somebody hears about God, the first time they hear about Holy Spirit and, and Jesus, this is what's their conflict. Their issue is, I only can relate to what I know based on what I'm, what I'm related to, what I know. In other words, I cannot go beyond what I know. A baby has a beginning. So God must have a beginning. That's a natural thought. And what we battle with is the linear thought process. We believe that God is subject to what we understand to be. So every time anything happens, we're like, you know, God is mad right now. No, stop it. Judgment is not now. Amen. Stop telling people to scare them. Yes, Christ will come back again, but the church ain't ready for that yet. Stop scaring people to come to church. Stop being boogeymen. Instead of being Christian, stop. Listen, a Christian is supposed to give hope to people so they can come to church. Amen. We got an umbrella for you. Amen. Now we got a sword that we're going to, if you don't get right, if you don't get right, just listen. There's people, that's, that's how they draw people to church. They go on trains and they go on, on, on these basket things and, and they go around telling people, the end is near, the sky is falling. And they spend more time doing this than worrying about this. Their message is about looking up. Watch, be careful, be careful. And they're bumping into everybody. And that's supposed to be the message of salvation. Sorry, that is not the message of salvation. The 
Jesus and salvation is love. It's drawing people to hope, to making people understand what it means to be complete. You're incomplete without God. Your decisions are incomplete. Your, your actions are incomplete. How you process is incomplete. You need the truth. That's why I tell people, when you start drawing away from God, I, I, I don't want to insult anybody, but when you start drawing away from God, you become dumber. The, the same person who said something that, full of intellect, full of knowledge and wisdom, the same person that years before was speaking some really good stuff, all of a sudden now you don't even know who you are. You can't even explain God anymore. Because your connection was to God. And his library is extensive. In the spirit, you were just catching it. You were talking to people, and, you, and then later on you'd be like, man, I said that. Has that happened to anybody here? And you just start you're tossing out stuff. Bah, bah, bah. You go home and go, man, I'm smart. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you start pulling away. And as you draw away, so does your connection. And one of the key elements of loose, pulling away is offense. You get offended easy. Your patience drops because now you're going back to your natural order of things. He who's wise, who causes you to be wise, he who gives you the wisdom to tolerate nonsense, now you've rejected that and now nonsense affects you. That's one of the first indicators that you're drawing back. And it doesn't mean that you completely left God. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about you drawing back. Mm -hmm. Now your nights are longer, like in, like in the North Pole and Alaska and, Alaska and, and South Pole. It's like the nights are just longer. And you're wondering why. And there's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you that when you understand the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in your life, he who gives wisdom will grant you wisdom to always make the right decisions. Thank you, Lord. Your choices become his choices. Your decision making is processed through him. You don't challenge because there's nothing to challenge. Now you're in a place of peace. And everyone around you, even those who are turbulent, can rock your boat. Wow. Your boat is stabilized by Holy Spirit. I'm not telling you the water's not going to hit. I'm not telling you that the people that are going to blow on you. I'm telling you that you're going to be so stabilized that you're going to be able to get to your point. Amen. Amen. Know him. Know him as the wonderful counselor. Know him. Know him as the mighty God. Know him. Know him as the everlasting Father. Listen to what I'm saying. For those who reject the paternal. Know him. The paternal is practice for the eternal. Brought to you by Holy Spirit. The paternal is just practicing. I'm here for practice. The real father is him. Even your earthly father cannot take the position of your heavenly father. And if you have a bad earthly father, he's the one, he's the thing you're not supposed to do. And, and he's what you're not supposed to look at. If you have a good earthly father, then he's also part of the pointing up to our heavenly father. Your hand is up, your hand is up, and we're going to close out after this one. Just had a really quick question. Um, I get the, the triune. Mm -hmm. My question was, um, you focused on that, um, the scripture, mm -hmm. and you said where you go next will be determined by the listening part. Can you elaborate on that? <laughs> so, it's one thing to believe God and believe in God, right? You believe in God. You know he's real, but you just don't believe his mandates. And there are a lot of people who live their lives believing in God, 
kind of like the way the devil, the devil believes in God. The devil believes in God, and according to the word, demons believe, and they tremble. The book of James. They believe in, and they tremble. I'm telling you that there's a part of connecting with who you believe in that requires you believing him. Because if you believe him, then everything falls in place because you start living a life according to his will. So believe in him is just, you just go and, oh, excuse me, you know he's there, so you kind of like move away and just keep walking. Did you catch that? I can believe that in, in this thing here, it's here. So that means that I'm not going to keep walking to bump into it. There's an area of obedience that comes up, that's a part of believing in God. So believe God. Believe his truth. Then your life is a peaceful life. And even though those who are turbulent in your border have to, are subject to that peace. You ever had somebody real angry and they come around you like, Because what you had was stronger than what they had. Their lack of peace met with your peace. And your peace dominated that moment. And you know, that's what has to happen with a lot of us. Even in our relationships with our spouses. Some of us who are in courtship. I don't call it boyfriend, girlfriend. Courtship, right? Those of us who are in courtship, we, we got to understand that there's, there's a level of peace that we carry that we can dominate the area, yeah. the moment. No, but I don't have hair in my tongue. You know we have a goo hair in our tongue. <laughs> but all right, so that makes you feel tough. I don't let nobody talk to me like that. That makes you weak. Yeah. Because you've allowed someone to rock your boat. Good, good. Let's stand. Oh, you had, you had, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, all right, my, uh, my question, yeah. Hello? All right. My question, uh, it goes back to what we were talking about before. This got so good that I, I forgot to ask it before, but uh, goes back to where, when, uh, when, when uh, we were talking about the, the blasphemy against the Holy, Spirit. the Holy Spirit. Right. Now, I was taught years ago that that still now it still it still applies. That I was told later on in life that it still applied. Not, not too long ago, and I was I was speaking to someone. It still applies. Right. But what you said today, and and I've heard you say this before. That's because Christ hadn't died yet when He said that. So it doesn't apply today because Christ died for all sins. Now, now let, let, let me explain something. I want people at home not to mistake this. I'm not saying it's okay to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Right. What I'm telling you, the consequence of that is not going to be one that is eternal because the Father already took it in by way of His Son. The judgment of that sin was already passed. Jesus died so that we wouldn't die with that one. What's the key then? The key is repentance, not remorse. You know, repentance is not getting caught and then saying, okay, I mean, it can turn into that, but that's not repentance. That's remorse. You got caught out there. <laughs> repentance is when you are by yourself and Holy Spirit starts dealing with you. And you go, I can't live like this anymore. Not because of anything I said, not because of anything anybody else said. Because Holy Spirit entered in and started transforming that side of you that's addicted to that thing. And when I say addiction, I don't mean I don't mean substance. I mean things that are in your life. You could be addicted to a certain way of speaking to people. This is just how I. This is who I am. No, it's not. I'm not like this. this you, no one can change me. Then that's a problem. So at the end of the day, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is a wrong thing. Just like blaspheming Jesus is wrong. Just like blaspheming the Father is wrong. But when Jesus said it, he was being truthful. Because nobody qualified. Amen. Did you hear what I said? Amen. That's why he had to go to hell down first. When he died, he had to go down first. He had to go to hell. Yes, it's in the Bible. 
I'll read that some other time. He had to go down to preach to those who disobeyed. Wow. Key word. They disobeyed. Why would you be preaching the good news to those who disobeyed? Mm -hmm. So no one in the day of judgment can say, I wasn't told. Right. Even those who passed away before. I'm not talking about now. Let me make that clear. I'm talking about before, yeah, you know, hey, gotta make that, put that down in there. I'm not talking about now, because some of us are dead, no, purgatory, no, no purgatory. I'm telling you that before Jesus died, there was the, the place of the dead. And the place of the dead was where everybody was, and Jesus went down to preach to them, to let them know, I give you the same access that I give everyone, present and future. You have to hear this. Let me tell you the good news. You can get out of this prison. I'm giving you the good news. Because when Jesus died, he died for all time. He died for all humanity. Past, present, and future. Please stand. Thank you, Lord. I give you praise, my God. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Father. I thank you for wisdom. Here's my prayer today. It's a simple prayer today. First of all, if there's anybody who wants to accept the Lord and the Lord and save you, please just walk up. If you, if you want to reconcile with the Lord, just walk on up. But here's my prayer today. The, the, the one thing I'm focusing on today is wisdom. Oh, a wise church is a church that makes wise decisions. A wise church is a church that puts things in order in their life. A wise church is a church that does self-inventory. A wise church is a church that recognizes the truth and understands that the truth is the only thing that sets you free. This is the teaching for this generation. And yet there are going to be people that are going to reject what you're saying because they've been beaten all their lives, law-driven all their lives, and they hear a message like this, they think it's new teaching, but this is the original teaching. So they reject, listen carefully, they reject this teaching because they say this is new teaching. No, it's not. Somebody taught something new along the way, and you're following that. And because it's been around so long in your lifetime, you think that that's old. I'm sorry, 80 years is not old. Not even nine, my mother, my, my mother, my grandmother is 99 years old. You say, oh my God, that's old. But in scope of the church, that's, that's a drop. And all she can actually say, all she can say is what she's learned. She looks at some of the hairstyles of my daughters and she goes in. She goes hard. <laughs> Amen. She's trying to call you out. You know, she'll, she'll look at, she's, she's one of those who believes that women can't whistle. They should have whistled. <laughs> she says, women don't whistle. But understand something. That's her, that was what she was given. So then a lot of people say, you got to go back to the old. What's the old? You mean in your lifetime that's the old? That's not the old. If you're telling me about your lifetime, I don't care if you're in the 80s. That's not the old. You're still not old in God's eyes. You're old to us because we're very young. We, 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 we base old in, in our life, lifespan. I'm sorry, it's older than that. And so the truth shall set you free. Can you say that with me? The truth shall set, set you free. This is the truth for this generation. This is the truth. Let it not, let it not catch you off guard. I pray for wisdom today. And anybody right now today who's desiring that, I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna touch and agree. Today's touching and agreeing day. Whatever God wants to do after that, so be it. I'm touching and agreeing. If that is you, I want you to come out from where you are and walk to the front. 
We're going to talk about the enhancement of wisdom. We're going to exchange enhancement of wisdom. We're going to pour in enhancement of wisdom. We're going to declare enhancement of wisdom. We're going to decree enhancement of wisdom. Wisdom! 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 To make wise decisions. Wisdom keeps you planted deep. Wisdom keeps you focused. Wisdom gives you strength. Wisdom fortifies you. Wisdom allows you to make good decisions. Wisdom. 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 Ah, oh, wisdom. Even Solomon, as wise as you thought he was, his wisdom was limited because he became dumb. In Ecclesiastes, he lost his, a lot of his wisdom. He showed it by his indecisiveness. He was confused. He didn't understand who God was because he was so much focused on other gods and other women who had other gods. So he lost a lot of his wisdom, the, that which, which we today say, man, in the Bible of all the men, of all the people, Solomon was the one who supposedly had the most wisdom outside of Jesus. I tell you now, you can connect with Holy Spirit and be wiser than even Solomon. Holy Spirit has all of the libraries that you need. And he wants you to connect. Those of you in the front, I want you to raise your hands up. We're going to give it all to the Lord right now. Those of you at home, we want to bless you. We thank you for joining us. May wisdom saturate your house. May wisdom permeate every area of where you walk. And may you be the light for others. Wisdom is also knowing when you don't have anything to give. If you are not receiving, if you don't come to receive and you always look at other people receiving, then I pray that you get wisdom Amen. to receive as well. Those are for those at home. Find a place that will speak the truth and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But the truth is connected to love. May you find a place where love reigns supreme. We thank you, we bless you, we give God all the glory, all the honor. Shalom.